system by which DNA is copied within our cells. Not surprisingly, of course, we can interfere with that process by interacting with one or more additional players to the story, additional enzymes, for example, which are involved in relaxing some of the twists in DNA. Not surprisingly, of course, other antibiotics can be considered in terms of how they could damage the function of additional components here as well. So knowledge of the system goes both ways. There are fundamental features of knowledge, the, the importance of the understanding of the system. Yet at the same time, they represent for us potential locations of intervention. And that potential for intervention now can define for us the possibility of, for example, antibiotics when trying to stop bacterial growth, or alternatively with variations on the same theme in mammalian systems, perhaps even the possibility of controlling aspects of cancer. And indeed, the copying of DNA is a very worthwhile area to consider as a mechanism of control in chemotherapeutics. Let's take the story back to what DNA contains, because we haven't really discussed too much about the importance of this order of bases. And indeed, we haven't even discussed the possibility that on a much larger scale there could be variations of the order of bases along a sequence. I think we recognise, of course, the sugar phosphate backbone is, is a fairly constant feature throughout, so that later on then we'll be only describing and discussing the contents of DNA really on the basis of just what those order of bases is like. But as we write it on a page now, we'll be describing it in terms of left to right will be just like our five prime to three prime. So that'll be the convention we're going to use. Any other variations in that convention, we should really show where the five primes and three primes are located. So then, the order of bases in DNA. How do we know that it really does vary substantially along a sequence? Well, to do that, you really have to have a look at a wonderfully classical piece of work that was done particularly by Ross Inman working with Marishnus. And what you can see in this image here is a DNA removed from a bacteriophage, a small virus which infects our familiar friend now, E. coli. So this particular DNA now is 48.5 kilobases, we know that now. It's double-stranded DNA. And it's possible to lay that down on a microscopic grid and by using EM, electron microscopy, to then see this rope-like structure, if you like, of DNA at high resolution, but typically just lays down like a thickly drawn line or slightly weak squiggly line, depending on how it's been laid. Now, if we take the DNA in contrast and we now subject it prior to the observation process to a denaturing agent, very gentle amounts of denaturing agent, we might expect to be able to separate out those strands of more weakly glued. In other words, where the ATs are present at a higher concentration compared to the GCs. And if we have a look at the structure here, you can start to pick out just those regions. This beautiful image now allows you to trace, and if you do this with your fingers, have a look at the image across the slide here, the image on your screen. As you do that now, double-strand DNA suddenly separates out, and it forms a bubble-like structure. Prediction that there's a much higher AT content in the regions separated out, within the regions still held together, there is still going to be predominantly a higher GC content. So we get a bubble, high AT, drops back down again, more GC for double strand DNA, follow along again, bubble again, higher AT content, and so forth. And you can literally define from one end, you can map where the higher AT content is along the structure. And indeed you can look at a number of these along the way to get a statistical appreciation of it. The remarkable thing is that they're spot on. You can take this kind of description and you can superimpose it now in our knowledge of the order of bases within DNA and see that the percent of AT content maps to those higher regions which happen to separate out as, as single strand DNA. Similarly, those held together regions have a higher GC content. So a plot, if you like, of AT content or GC content, the case may be, superimposes wonderfully upon this entire image along the way. So now we can appreciate the DNA sequence varies along a structure. And obviously, of course, it doesn't simply depend upon the features that correspond just to this lambda bacteriophage DNA.
It's the same thing working our way through a wide range of DNA sources, species, and of course includes human sequences as well. So to recognize, of course, the information flow must go from the sequence content. Of course, we now begin to recognize that that process requires to draw information from the particular segments that encode within the structure to be able to make RNA and protein. And on this slide, we see the flow of genetic information. That flow classically is described as DNA to RNA to protein. And DNA to RNA to protein, shown by the two arrows over here, is referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology. Indeed, it was a great way to get a Nobel Prize, was to demonstrate that uh, indeed that central dogma doesn't always apply, and it's given rise to a wonderful, uh, very precise paradigm system that explains alternatives in terms of reverse flow of information. But just to stick to the major story now, when it's asked ourselves, if information content exists within DNA, how is it then that the information carries through? Well, the simplest way to view that is that, of course, there are modules of information. And the clear modules over here are those that encode a single RNA or a single protein. Uh, that's the simplest way to view the story. And those single modules can be referred to as a reading frame, if we wish, or an open reading frame. And the terminology open reading frame, or ORF, happens to be the clear description that we typically would use in terms of interpreting information once we have knowledge of sequence. So, let's have a bit of a closer look at, at the process of information flow in terms of this very brief overview. On the next slide, you can see this description of transcription and translation. I've called this a classical viewpoint. Because DNA, of course, obviously, as you've seen, is replicated, and it's shown by the strands separating out. But we also recognize that even when it's not being replicated, the information content's there. That contained information content now, whether sitting in the nucleus, whether sitting as part of a nucleoid structure and bacteria, either way, though, it has to be read. So the DNA now is partly unraveled locally in regions where, for example, an open reading frame might be. There is a starting point, typically referred to as the promoter region, which is the starting point for RNA synthesis. And the RNA synthesis will proceed through using an enzyme RNA polymerase to make this, this copy, this RNA copy of just the segment until so eventually a termination occurs when the entire coding sequence for that particular module is obtained. Now that copy of RNA is referred to as a transcript. And you can see that in the name transcription. But why is it called a transcript? Well, typically, if we were to write down information, for example, such as that which you're hearing from this lecture now, we write it down, it's referred to as a transcript. You're making a copy in writing. Using the same language it will take, I hope, that is that you're hearing now, but at the same time, of course, you're copying it down onto a piece of paper. Perhaps with occasional mistakes along the way, but indeed, nature does much the same type of thing. It's taking the same four-letter code, A, C, G, and T, and copying down the same information content just for that module of information. And that module now, this transcript, of course, is in a very similar collection of letters, in this case, A, C, G, and U, where U replaces T, but it's still base pairs in an AU base pair. And that transcript is shown over here as the RNA across the middle of the image. Now, it's the same kind of language, give or take. It still consists of these four letters or four bases. And therefore, of course, because it's much the same language, transcript or transcription seems to be appropriate to copying down the information content, perhaps with a marginal mistake along the way. In contrast, though, what we now recognize is we go from a four-letter system across towards a system which is 20 letters, amino acids in proteins. And so we're going from one language to another, the language of nucleotides across to the language of amino acids, proteins. 